Hey everyone, I'm Roy Townsend, and I'm the Grove Pastor here at the River Church. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way to do this is to text River Connect one word to 97,000, or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and our upcoming events. If you'd like to give to the River Church today, you can text an amount that you want to give to 84321, or you can visit our website and click on the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the message today. So kind of like I said, the next uh, this week particularly a little bit heavy, but I really look at the next three weeks it's kind of like one overarching sermon. And no, I'm not going to preach for three hours right now, and then we're just going to go back to it. But like, Jesus really kind of goes into three important topics. So this week, we're going to kind of talk about lost adultery. Next week, we're going to talk about divorce. And that, again, that's a very, very complicated, very difficult conversation. And then the following week, we're going to talk about oaths. And I do think that like Jesus isn't just rattling off spark notes here. I, I really do think that he, he's kind of blending this all into one kind of thought. So for me, uh, we're going to kind of go into these and hit that. So it's going to be really, really easy to skip out on church next week, especially if you're like, man, that, that was a doozy. That, that gathering, the, the preaching, talking about adultery, talking about lust, like that was heavy. I'm not going to go next week. If you're somebody here, again, wherever your marriage is at or whether you've been divorced or remarried, wherever it is, again, that's not a scarlet letter, but it'd be easy to be like, I don't want to sit through that. But I want to challenge you. Don't let your flesh run away. Don't let your heart just, do, I, I can't say this, come and sit through truth. Again, we're not being judgmental. We're not turning around and looking at people and being like, you go sit on that side of the church, you go sit on that side of the church. But we do have to look at some of these things. So for me, like looking at the next three weeks, I think you all know me well enough, I, I, I looked at family. And I love all things family ministry. So again, I love early childhood. I love the nursery that we have. I like high school. I love middle school. I love the River Kids team that we have. I like young adults. I'm even at the point where like, I love working with young marrieds, people who are just like kind of stepping off uh, the cliff, so to speak, into marriage. I, I like working with watching marriages get healed and restored and redeemed. And then again, like that becomes healthy between the husband and wife. And then this is the biggest thing. When you have a healthy marriage, you really start seeing healthy parenting. So for me, when I, when I look through the Bible, like I, I see family ministry from Genesis to Revelation. It's just a constant theme. It's a, it's a weaving uh, kind of thread that I see whenever I read that. So my passion is to always see families get stronger. If you're like, but I got a baby, that's family. I got a weird middle schooler, family. I'm a young adult family. I'm, I'm about to get married. Family, parenting, family, marriage, family. I see family as that holistic thing that the church needs to make sure they're taken care of. And I think you've all heard me say this quote, strong churches don't make strong families, but strong families make strong churches. So for me, the reason why I really push into families is if we can start seeing families outside of our regimented hours, we see people outside of church hours teaching the gospel preaching the gospel and praying together and reading the Bible together and pushing each other to live for Jesus, what's going to happen when they come back to church? What's going to happen when they come to a gathering or come to a growth community? You're going to see a stronger church. So for me, that, that, that's the big, big, big push that I always have. So this week, we're going to kind of talk about uh, the cause. We're going to talk about the toxin. We're going to talk about the poison. So to jump into it, Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 reads, and you heard it, you heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Yeah, we're going there. That's the conversation. So Jesus hits us. He's quoting number seven on Moses' Ten Commandments. You shall not commit adultery. And the thing that I find like, interesting about this is as much as, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but we live in a very, very sensual culture. We live in a culture that you can find anything anywhere on your phone. It's a problem. 2,000 years ago, Jesus still had to turn around and say, this is a problem. It might not be the same problem. It might be manifested differently. It might be egregious in different ways. Adultery, sexual sin, was just as big of a problem in Jesus' day as it is our day. 
So Jesus goes into this. You shall not commit adultery. And for the Jewish people who are listening to Jesus speak this while Jesus is sitting on this hill, they would have instantly gone to this idea of this outwardly act of adultery. And just for kind of definition's sake, what is adultery? Adultery is having sexual relations with somebody who is not your spouse. This could be extramarital. I cheated on my wife. I cheated on my husband. That is adultery. But also that can be premarital because that person is not your spouse yet. That is somebody else's spouse, possibly. But what if we do get married? Still no, because they're not your spouse. You don't get to like get rid of the covenant for the convenient. So when Jesus is saying, again, do not commit adultery, and again, this is even what Moses spoke, this is what God told Moses to put down, this is what he's going after. Extramarital, premarital, sexual relationship. It's adultery. And similar to what we kind of talked about last week, though, when Jesus was talking about anger. So let's just deal with the outward problem. Don't do it. We'll just preach abstinence. We'll give everybody a ring. You can sign a piece of paper and say you swear that you won't do it. We'll put it in an envelope. And get... What does that do? Maybe helps. Not to say purity rings or having those conversations and those conferences aren't bad. I, I like those conversations. But if you just talk about the external... I think you're missing what Jesus is really trying to go to. So when we're talking about anger, don't get angry at somebody. Okay, so just stay in my lane. I'll smile no matter what. And I'm just like, no, it's, it's the heart here. Because we got to realize that we cannot fulfill the law. Our outwardly actions cannot put us in a place where we're able to just live perfect, obedient lives. Because why? Because our hearts, because our hearts are saturated with sin. So when Jesus says, but I say to you, He's not condemning, he's not washing away, he's not getting rid of Moses's again, number seven. What he's saying is that you guys have got it all wrong. Because the reality is people were just walking around being like, it's not my wife, it's not my wife, it's not my wife. We'll talk about a little bit what the Pharisees were doing next week when we talk about divorce. It's, it's not, my, I married, I'm good, I'm set. They're finding ways to loophole this adultery situation. But Jesus is saying, but I say to you, don't try to get out of it. Don't try to wiggle away. Don't try to make some loopholes and don't put some asterisks on it. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with, his, with her in his heart. What Jesus is saying, now again, you're like, oh, sweet, this is a sermon for the guys. All the ladies can take it. No. The primary audience that the Bible is always written to was males. It does not alleviate women. So adultery is not just a guy problem. This is a female problem. This is a humanity problem. If you have a heart and you've been born, you have sin in your heart, this is humanity's problem we deal with. But Jesus is looking at us, similar to anger. You're only focused on the external. You've got to look at the internal. Because if you look at a woman with lustful intent, you have fallen. You are guilty. So we've got to stop and we've got to look at this sometimes. Just because I didn't do an action, I did it internally. Nobody knows. It was private. I'm good. No, it's actually just as bad. But if it's public, again, then, the, then, then everybody knows. No, Jesus is getting to the root of the problem. He's not attacking the fruit of the problem. He's, he's going, like, again, when you look with lustful intent, your heart has already gone guilty. If you really, everyone who has looked at a woman with lustful intent has already, already, meaning it's, it's already happened. If you're looking, it's already gone. If you've looked, if you've glanced, if, you, if you're looking that with an intent that is self-worship, self-gratification, all those things, you've already fallen. So for us, we have to take a look at this. So looking, looking. That's in person. It's on a phone. It's on a computer. Uh, pastor Caleb, he's the Holly location pastor, and I were talking about this. Uh, it, it's a book by Steve Farha, but it's called Point Man. So if you guys are looking for a book, uh, a really good thing. But Pastor Caleb sent me a thing. He said, uh, this, Steve Farha said, I've been walking around with a grenade since 2007. He was referring to his cell phone. How easy it is how quick it is. 
And then we just turn around and give them to 11-year-olds. Here's your phone, buddy. Good luck. We as adults know the toxicity and the loaded grenade aspect of how bad that can destroy a person's life. All I can think about, and this is a Parks and Rec joke, and if you've never seen the show, there's a guy, he has, he has a loaded landmine sitting on his desk. And he's like walking around like this is the coolest thing. Like imagine walking around with an explosive in your pocket. If you trigger it, you bump it too hard, you fall, you trip, it's going to have catastrophic ramifications. But that's us. Just looking can be a grenade. And the thing is, we also have to get to it like, oh, that, that, that's just a guy thing. This isn't just a male problem. So yes, while men are visually stimulated, men are visually charged, what if it's looking for an emotion? It's looking for a fulfillment. It's looking for imagination. It's looking for, for, uh, looking for that just emotional connection. So yeah, while it might not be glaring at a dude for a woman, what if it's imagining? Wish I had somebody who could be sensitive. I wish somebody could turn around and just have that conversation with me. I wish I, I wish I had somebody who was tender and sensitive. So yeah, while it's not looking per se for a woman, it could be longing. It's still looking. It's just not necessarily with your eyes. You're looking for fulfillment in the same way. In the same way a guy looks at a woman lustfully for sexual fulfillment, a woman could be looking at a man for emotional fulfillment. Both are sin. Both are adultery. Both are lusting. And then Jesus goes into Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, some of the most pointed things Jesus could ever say. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Whew. Not just in the pit, not just in like, hey, that's not bad, that's just Hell. Like, you're, you're going to the instant, like, the complete removal, the complete absence, the final destination of those who declare that Jesus is not Lord. Hell. It's just adult. It's just looking. It's just porn. It's just my phone. Hell. We cannot undersell this problem. We cannot look at God and be like, well, it's just a little. Hell. You consider, and if your right hand causes you to sing, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body going into hell. The consequences of unrepentant sin is hell. And Jesus is saying it's better that you get hacked to pieces than to live in sin. Think about that. It's better that you lose an arm than to continue to live in sin. It's better that you lose an eye. It's better that you lose a foot. You can be, no offense, you can be a nub of a person, but it's better you lost all of those things than to live a life of unrepentant sin. He's not just, it's just this. It's better that you lose this. So while studying this, I, I take a look at this, and I'm like, this isn't just a, oh, it's just, here's the quick conversation, it's awkward, and then we move forward. Jesus is getting at this, again, your heart is going to fall way before your hands ever do. Just think about this. Again, your heart falls. You've already committed adultery. Your head falls. You start thinking. You're having lust in your head. Your eyes are falling and you're watching. And then your hands fall. The cutting off your hands is the absolute fruit of the entire problem. Because your heart fell you got to remove members of your body. you got to take out your hands. I think so often for us, when we look at sin, we hardly ever go to the heart. Well, it's, 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 it's her fault because she's dressed that way. Well, it's their fault because they didn't put an internet blocker on me. It's, it's, it's their fault because they sent it first. It's their fault because they, they started flirting. It's his fault because he was sensitive. It's his fault because he struck up a conversation. It's his fault because he was hanging around my cubicle. We don't ever look at our heart and realize how deceitful it is, how sinful it is, how rebellious it is. So for us to look at it, again, your heart will fall way before your hands ever do. Your heart will fall way before your eyes ever do. 
your heart will fall way before your head does. So for us, we, we got to take a second and look at this. Like, it's not just the external. We got to look at the internal. So I love being able to use the Bible just to like paint a, like a, a picture just to kind of really illuminate what it is. So if you got your Bibles, we're going to be in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, and we're going to look at David. Now, David was a guy who was labeled God, a man after God's own heart. David would have been this brave guy who stared down Goliath with five stones. Didn't have his own armor, didn't have a sword, took a slingshot to fight the Goliath of Gath, who was like the top champion of that entire army. David was also, while he was a brave dude's dude, he was also like super, super sensitive. He was a poet. He was a songwriter. Like David was like the total package. David was the king. David was God's anointed. David had everything. But we're going to see in 2 Samuel chapter 11, David fell. But how did he get there? I think so many times, and we'll get to uh, chapter 11 in a second, a lot of times we're like, well, David walked out and he saw Bathsheba in a uh, a bathtub. It happened way before that. David's heart already fell before David even got put in that situation. In 2 Samuel chapter 5 verse 13, it says, And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came to Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to David. David actually, at this point, David already had like seven wives. And that wasn't good. That was outside of God's plan. But God did not smite him. God did not destroy him. God did not like drop that like iron or the heavy hand of the Lord on David at that point. God was not pleased. But this is also where we can't always have a a, a vengeful, wrathful God. We have a God that is full of mercy and patience and kindness. So David was already out of line by having seven wives. But then in chapter 5 here, look at that word. David took the self-gratification, the self-honoring, that I need this, that aggressive mentality, that sin took root in David's heart. I took more wives. I took concubines. Seven wasn't enough for you, dude? You needed more? That reveals David's fallen heart. You already sinned. Not even to mention in Deuteronomy chapter 17, 17, uh, kind of the exact uh, specifications for a king. It says, and he shall not acquire, this is talking about kings, he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. David knew God's law. David knew the Bible. David was a man after God's own heart. David was not ignorant to what he was supposed to be as a king. David would have known Deuteronomy 17, 17. But David took, and he did not listen to the warning that his heart would turn away. He didn't care. Because at the moment when you start taking, the only person you care about is yourself. The only person you care about is your needs, your wants, your desires, your kingdom. So David's heart had already turned away at this point in chapter 5. And then we get to chapter 11. And I think we all kind of know the story. And in the spring of this year, of the year, the time when kings went out to battle, David sent Joab, his servant with him, and all of Israel. And they they ravaged the Ammonites, and they besieged Rabah. But David remained in Jerusalem. I always enjoy the first sentence in this. In the spring of that year, so specific. We know the exact time of the fall. But David was supposed to lead his armies. David's heart had fallen. And David was no longer where he was meant to be. I think one of the things that we got to look at when it comes to any type of sin, but especially when it comes to anything with adultery, lust, and sexual sin, when your heart has fallen, you stop putting yourself where you need to be. Because when your heart has fallen and you're struggling with things, it's really easy to start skipping like gatherings. It's really easy to start skipping growth communities. You stop praying, you stop reading your Bible, you stop tithing, you stop serving, because again, you're holding that, and you stop being where you need to be. Now, David physically wasn't where he needed to be, but also, we already see that spiritually he wasn't where he needed to be. We see emotionally, we'll see that in a little bit, he's not where he needs to be. So the first thing, again, when your heart falls, you're not where you need to be. But also, you become who you're not supposed to be. David was king. David knew the law. David knew all those things. David also was husband. David was father. And because David's sin had taken root, David was no longer who David needed to be. 
he stopped being the father to the rest of his kids. And well, actually, after Bathsheba, the entire ruin follows David for the rest of his life. And it's rooted in this situation. But he's no longer being the proper husband to his other seven wives, even though that's horrible in and of itself. When your heart turns away, you no longer be where you need to be. You no longer are who you need to be. And then 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2, and it happened. It's such a monumental historical moment in the Bible. It happened late one afternoon. This isn't just a, hey, we're recounting, we're trying to figure it out. I, I would even actually argue David probably had some conversation. Solomon probably had some conversation about this. This is so vividly, accurately recorded that it happened. What happened? One afternoon. Like they know the time, the date. They know exactly what happened. When David arose from his couch and he was walking on the roof of the king's house and he saw from a roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. So what happened? David gets up. David has the ability to walk around. Again, the palace is up top. He's able to look down on people's houses. And he sees a woman. Now here's the thing that we got to understand. that The sin was not looking at the woman. The sin was continually looking at the woman. The sin was not walking out and like, boop, nope, 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 awkward, going back in. Nope. Call somebody like, hey, can we get her a bath curtain? Can we? And does she know she's doing that? Like, again, that would have been the wise thing to do. Again, David has a palace. He can go hang out anywhere. He can go to the other side of the palace and look out in the exact same way. David's sin was not walking out and being like, oh, there she is. David's sin was continually looking. David turned from a guy who saw to a guy who was creepily leering. His sinful stare became an obsession. He didn't walk away. David's sin in his eyes. He saw, and he didn't immediately run. David saw, and his heart was already gone. So it just continued the process. So David abandoned God at this moment? No, David still knew God. David was still God, man after God's own heart. But, but the sin here, the sin took over David's life. And so often we push God out of the center of our heart and we start living for our wants, our needs, our desires, ourselves. And it just continues. David at this moment, I, I, David wasn't necessarily just being like, I don't believe in God, I'm a fool, I, I'm an atheist now, I'm done doing this stuff. David's sin had caused his heart to turn. When his heart, when his heart turned and he looked, instead of holding his mind or his thoughts captive and obeying God, he allowed his eyes to keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going. Now I've heard people be like, but, but Bathsheba knew. She knew what she was doing. Maybe. I, I don't see anywhere in the text that she did. I don't see anywhere in the text that she didn't. Technically, culturally, to bathe in the middle of the afternoon would have been contrary to what most tradition would have been. She knew. I, I, I don't see that very well, but in the same right, I, I think that there's definitely some unwiseness here. I don't think she knew what she was doing, but in the same right, if she was, she's caught up in it too. My focus is David. But in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 3 and 4, it says, And David sent to inquire about the woman. So again, now we're at the part, his heart's already fallen, his mind's fallen, his eyes are fallen. Now his hands are starting to fall. And not only does he not have the bravery to go find her himself, as the king, he sends somebody. I need you to go figure out who it is. And the one of them said, Is that not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent a messenger and took her. And she came to him, and he lied with her. Now, in parentheses, parentheses are always important things to see in the Bible. Now, she had, purif she had been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. Then she returned to her house. At best, this is a consensual sin. At best, Uri um, Uriah, innocent man, his wife cheated on him. David cheated on his wives. At worst, David raped her. And I know that's heavy to hear. But that's how hard it can hit when you start thinking about, I'm going to take, and I'm going to take, and I'm going to take. You no longer look at anybody else, and you only look at people as your property. This is why sexual sin has to be dealt with. Because he took her in the same way that he took concubines. To make it worse, again, and now she had been purifying herself from uncleanliness. 
there's a strong chance that what Bathsheba was doing, bathing, was she was actually cleaning herself after her menstrual cycle, which would have been a commandment in the Old Testament. She was making sure that she was honoring God. She was making sure that she was living to proper livelihood. And what did David do in that moment? Not only did David defile Bathsheba, he's defiling God's statutes. He's defiling God's law. He, he's taken away an ability for a woman to worship and live for her life. So why does God bring the justice down? Because that's how far David's heart had taken him. And then we see again, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 5, and the woman conceived and she sent to David and she said, I'm pregnant. What happened first? David's heart fell. Then David's head fell. Then David's eyes fell. David's hands fell. And then it gets worse. He calls Uriah back. Hey, man, come back home. I just want to talk to you boy to boy. Why don't you go home? Uriah's a righteous man. He's like, I, I, I can't go be with my wife right now. We're not, we're not going to do any of these military conjugal visits. Like, my, my boys are fighting. The Ark of the Covenant's gone. Like, I, I can't do that. I'll sleep on the doorpost. David's like, oh, that ain't good. Tries it again in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 9. But Uriah slept on the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord, and he did not go to his house. That's where Uriah's at. He's like, good, I'll sleep on the doorpost, man. I can't go sleep there. I can't go home. I'm not doing that. So David pushes him again. David invites him over. They start drinking. David gets him drunk. Hey, man, you should go back. Uriah, the same way. I, I, I can't. My guys are fighting. The Ark of the Covenant's gone. I, I can't be home right now. This is what I love. God is too good to let you live in your sin. God is too good to let you get away with your sin. How in the world could a drunk guy, military guy, not come home and be like, yeah, sure, man, I'm just going to go home? Only because the grace of God was in Uriah's heart, making sure Uriah wouldn't. And all along, David is freaking out. Don't go running around the rabbit trail on this one because I'm not trying to, this sin's worse than this sin. Drunk Uriah shows, shows more righteousness than adulterer David. Uriah was drunk. That is a sin. And even in his drunkenness, he's like, I can't do that. I can't sin that way. I, I, the, the, Ark of the, Covenant's, the Ark of the Covenant's gone. I can't, I can't go be with my wife, man. My boys are fighting, man. That'd be, that'd be horrible for me. Drunk Uriah had more righteousness. And again, they're both very fleeting righteousness. But again, Uriah was living a better life than a daughter of David. So for David, David's heart was that far gone. David's heart fell, causing David's head to fall, causing David's eyes to fall, causing, causing David's hands to fall, causing David to become a liar. You want to know whose native tongue is lies? The devil. Liar. Couldn't go own it. Couldn't go confess. Couldn't go put himself out there and be like, I've fallen. Tried to get away with it. Tried to hide it. Tried to sweep it under the rug. But God is too good to let us get away with our sins. But then it gets worse. Because David becomes a murderer. Sends Uriah out to go fight on the lines all alone. Pulls the army back. And how'd it happen? It started because David's heart withdrew from the Lord. It walked away. In every other train wreck of a situation that this brought was caused because David's heart walked away from God. It did not listen to God. It did not try to live a holy life for God. So for kind of the application, I want to walk it back for a second. The first thing that we got to get to is, again, when you become a liar, when you're living in any sin, especially sexual sin, but any sin in general, if you're going to walk around and you're going to lie, where in the world is your heart? What are you doing? Because again, God can't come in your life and cleanse you and help you and give you the strength to get through it if you're going to continually lie. If you're going to lie to God, if you're going to lie to people, if you're going to walk around as a liar, how are you going to be justified and cleansed and forgiven? 
We have to look at sin and sin and be like, man, it's not that big of a deal. It is. Because if you're lying here, you're lying across the board. And God is too good to let you live there. Second thing we got is his hands. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, it says, Flee from sexual immorality. For every other sin a person commits is outside of the body. But the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not have known that your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? That also means for other people. Well, your body is the temple for the Holy Spirit. God made it for, again, this is where God comes and resigns. So sexual sin and your own thing, again, that hurts your temple. But in the same right, if you start hurting other people, you're not hurting that temple. So God's looking at us. Again, when our hands start to fall, our heart is gone, our eyes are gone, everything's gone, and we start using our hands, just understand where you're putting yourself. When you hear that somebody is valued and loved by God, and they have worth. How dare we try to take? How dare we try to turn them into objects? But we got to look at this. When our hands start to fall and it's outside the permissibilities of marriage. Ooh. It's not just, oh, it's just a thing. No. We have to protect it. And again, eyes. Job 31 verse 1. It says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How could I not get And How then could I gaze at a virgin? Again, David walked out, saw Nope, don't look there. This doesn't mean you walk like this for the rest of your life. Look at your shoes the entire time, but in the same right, like, nope, can't look that way. Nope, can't look that way. Nope, 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 nope. This is the time, I, I don't know, does anybody ever look at their phone to get themselves out of awkward conversations when they're walking? And the, again, that just landed for everybody, so I'm not the only one. But you're, you see somebody, you're like, oh, man, I'll just put on my phone real quick, and I'll just look down and keep walking. Like, Oh, yep, can't look there. Oh, yeah, it's uh, 1235. Yeah, okay. Oh, good. Oh, Do that. I have made a covenant with my eyes. If you're like, again, the first glance is okay. But if it's not an exact warning signal in your heart to be like, nope, not looking there, it's when you're like, I've made a covenant with my eyes. David's heart fell. And again, and then his head fell. Causing his eyes just to like, I'm just going to leer. Don't do that. Make sure you protect your eyes. But again, your head. I love this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. And we destroy arguments and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So when our heart falls, it starts making our mind fall. We start thinking about stuff. We start obsessing about things. We start daydreaming. Or our brains start going in directions that we shouldn't. We start hoping and wishing and we linger longer. But you hold every thought captive. Why? To obey Christ. Because if you're not holding thought, your thoughts captive, your eyes are going to start wandering. If you're not holding your thought captive, your eyes start wandering again. What's going to start happening? Your hands are going to start wandering. Your hands start wandering and you're going to become a liar. But where does that start from? It all stems from one really, really important place. The heart. So when Jesus says, we'll go back, Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 to 28. You have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This is the key. If you're looking at how to help your marriage, you're looking at how to adultery and lust-proof your marriage or your life or help your teenager or you get through it yourself. If you're looking at all these external things that you're going to do, I'm going to have an accountability group. I'm going to have a website blocker. I want to make sure that I'm at church all the time. Like Good things, good tactics, good external out there for protection. But if your heart is gone, if your heart is not where it needs to be with Jesus, if your heart is not solely rooted in making sure that you're living obediently for him, everything else will fall. Because your hands will fall after your heart falls. Your heart falls way before your eyes do. Your heart falls way before your head does. And we have to be in a spot where we look at this. It's the heart. You can have external things, and again, I, I think that's wise, but it doesn't mean anything if your heart isn't where it needs to be. 
Ezekiel 36, 26, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you the heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Whenever you talk about, again, sexual sin, anytime you talk about lust, anytime you talk about adultery, it goes up in a gathering like a lead balloon. There's that, ugh, I don't get as much amens and hooting and hollering and laughing. And again, this is a heavy topic. But to really look at it, I think so often where I'm just going to protect my hands, I'm going to protect my eyes, protect my mind. Those are good things to do. But if you're not protecting your heart, and the only way that we can protect our heart is asking Jesus to protect our heart. The only way that we can protect our heart from making sure that we don't long and lust and to want what we want and to take what we should not take. We have to look at stuff like Ezekiel 36 when God says, I will give you a new heart. God loves us too much to let us live in sin. God is too good to not <laughs> to, to allow us to get away with that. But the reason why he doesn't allow us to get away with it is because he wants us to run back to him. He wants us to know the gospel. He wants us to come to a place where, again, we're not living for ourselves, but we're living for the one who gives us a new heart, who has redeemed us, who puts his spirit inside of us. So often when we have these conversations, oh, just put up some internet blockers, we'll pray about it. Real talk, do you ever stop and look at your heart? Because if you're able to be a liar, where's your heart? If you're able to go touch things that don't belong to you, where's your heart? If you're able to stare at something that is not you, yours with lustful intent, and how can I get and I get and I get and I'm going to take and take and take, where's your heart? For me, it comforts me to know that God put his spirit in me. It comforts me to know that there is no sin that can overcome me. It comforts me to know that I have somebody who has my back. And again, I love it, Romans, when it says, if our God be for us, whom shall ever be against us? Sexual sin is a big deal. Lust is a big deal. Adultery is a big deal in the church. We can't just look at it and like, oh, the world's struggling with that. I've seen too many people fall. I've known of too many pastors who fell. It's not just a, oh, it's out there. It's in here. And I think why that happens it's because we put so much external focus on, let's just make sure, watch your eyes, watch your hands, don't touch, leave room for Jesus, I can't fit a Bible in between you. Instead of looking at people in the eye and be like, where's your heart? So for me today, my, my prayer for you, where are you at? Where is your heart? Where is your heart when it comes to living purely? Husbands. Where's your heart for loving your wife as your one and only? She's it. Wives, your husband is your one and only. Not the cute guy who walks around your cubicle. Not the internet people. It's your husband. But she's got faults, he's got faults. Yes, he does. Welcome to the world. It was more romantic when we were dating. Yes, it probably was. Where's your heart for your spouse? The one that you took a covenant to the Lord and said, they are my one and only. Because if that's broken, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. If you're here and you're single and you're taking things that don't belong to you, I invite you to pray with me. And if you're here and you're just like, I I I'm just struggling right now with this, I will give you a new heart way that we get a new heart is we ask Jesus to come in and come and live in my life. And Lord, because you died on a cross for this sin and every other sin, Lord, you can cleanse me. You can redeem me. You can give me purpose, Lord. You can give me the power to live righteously for you. But if you're struggling today, again, like I said, it's really easy to do that from a 10,000 foot view. If you're struggling with it, I'd love for you to take an altar. Not so people can look at you and be like, ha, ha, ha. Do it because that's the first act of not being a liar. That's the first act of coming forward and being like, I'm going to put myself out there. I don't care if people see me. I want to make sure God sees me right now. 
But if you have this struggle, again, I, I got some guys who are ready to pray with you. I'd be ready to pray for you. Ladies, if you're here, again, it's not just a guy problem. But is your heart where it needs to be? Is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace, the love, and the sanctification that comes from the blood of Jesus at the center of your heart? Because you can turn around and you can burp your eyes and you can turn around and watch your hands. You can turn around and I'm going to get rid of my phone. It doesn't take away your heart because your heart is naturally going to find a way to sin. Because at Jesus' time, he didn't have cell phones. They still had that problem. So for us, if you need prayer, if this is your first step, come to Jesus and say, Lord, give me a new start, heart. Put your spirit in me so I can obey you.